get some sounds here. So if you play guitar and you watch videos here on YouTube, you're probably familiar with my friend Corey. Corey is a professional guitarist and instructor, and he also has a fantastic YouTube channel as well as a bunch of really awesome guitar courses. Now, even though I'm a bit of a hack guitarist, my interest, of course, was in Corey's epic home studio setup that he does all of his work in. So of course, today we're gonna go over to Corey's and check out his home studio setup. I'll put links to Corey down in the description. This video is sponsored by our friends at Sweetwater. So as we're going through checking out Corey's home studio, check out those links down in the description. It'll take you to sweetwater.com where you can find just about anything you need for your guitar collection that you have or your home studio setup. And those links are affiliate links, so it's a great way to support my channel by just simply getting stuff that you're already gonna get for your studio. So thank you, Sweetwater, for sponsoring this video. Lastly, if you're new to the channel, press the subscribe button down there. We have hundreds of other studio tours here on the channel as well as a bunch of clips. Let me know what you think of Corey's studio down below, and Corey, take it away. Hey, I'm Corey. Welcome to my home studio. So this room is just a little 10 by 12 space in my house. It was a guest room and I had a studio in, a, in the adjacent room that was a smidge smaller and I had to completely convert everything because I needed more space for gear and just everything that comes with that. And it was never to do anything other than really just track instruments, you know, do tracking sessions for clients that would reach out to me. And as sort of the playing guitar online world evolved, my space needed to evolve as well. And it always is, um, mostly aesthetically, because I can I have about as much stuff crammed in here as I possibly can. Um, but that's that's pretty much it. I'm here every day working on either um, my online videos, online guitar courses, and recording sessions for, for clients that are typically um, what I call out-of-towners who send me their stuff um, and want me to remotely track for them, which is also a lot of fun and why I have all this stuff set up the way I do. How often are you moving things around in here? So being that this is a small space, <laughs> I'm moving things around all the time. I mean, it wasn't up until about two weeks ago where I couldn't push this chair back any further because there was guitar speakers and boxes and just cases, all sorts of stuff. Um, it's the the life of living in a small small house with small parameters, you know, yeah. and having a lot of gear. Um, and we just built a shed in the backyard, so I have road cases in there now and all kinds of stuff. But um, I was prepping not only for Andrew, but to give myself less clutter, and thankfully it's finally feeling better. I mean, just having an extra space, uh, place to sit yeah. and practice or just relax is is much nicer. And then I can just, I leave and I go out in the living room and hang out too and um, clear my mind because having these lights on you all the time, doing this stuff, it can be a little draining because it's not natural. But what I like to do is shut the stuff off and just have some of these vibier lights happening and that makes it feel a little bit more comfortable too. How long have you been working out of this space? Well, I've been out of the house uh, for about five years and this space probably about three and a half or so. Like I said, it was in another room in my house that I'm remodeling, basically just kind of painting and redecorating, but there's a little bit of fixing going on. Um, so yeah, about three and a half-ish years or so, and it's been an evolution. Yeah, I couldn't imagine having a bigger space because I'd have to fill it with more stuff and more decor, <laughs> you know, but you know, never say never. The highlight of this room to me is this amp wall here. 
and if you could just sort of break it down for me. So I built this amp wall recently and I didn't build it. A really good friend of mine and a great engineer and producer and master woodworker, Kenny Varga here in Nashville, um, he built this cabinet for me. We spec'd it out the size um, just to kind of not make it too tall. I didn't want it to feel like it was falling over on me. But the whole idea is that I love amplifiers. Um, and when I've ever seen big studios or people that have cartridge rigs that bring them into the studio, they always have these wonderful cabinets. Now, I, this wouldn't leave the house. Um, it, it is on wheels, which is cool though. But I wanted something that could be more permanent to where I could have the workflow of using these amps because when I'm tracking something, they are instruments to me. They all have their own personal flavor. Um, and the only thing I needed really to complete it was an amp switcher. That's what the Kahayan is here. Now there's other amp switchers on the market, but this one was the one that spoke to me the most. Um, Kenny built me this little rack for it. There's another rack under the desk he built. He really set me up. And the speakers essentially are my aux boxes. I don't have any live cabinets anywhere in the house. Now, fingers crossed, someday I'll have a bunker that I can do that with, <laughs> but we, we can't all be Tim Pierce, right, Tim? No. <laughs> That's why Tim is Tim. He is, he is the godfather and, um, <laughs> man, just an inspiration top to bottom. Um, but I can, I can turn this stuff on. Let's, uh, let's turn some amps on. Yeah. And let's turn up some stuff here. So we're gonna go to one. So I have them going like kind of one through eight. I don't have eight total. I have six. That one is my live amp, so I don't really uh, you know hook it up because it's you know I gotta disconnect everything. Sure. But but if I want um, any variety of amp, you know whether it's like a nice sort of mid rangey sort of like you know um, great Larry Carlton sort of Robin Fordish sort of thing. So in my workflow, if I'm saying, well, I want a clean amp that I want to use with pedals, I might use my two rock, nice clean sound. And I can add any of my pedals like I normally would. And it gives me the same experience that I would have pretty much, you know, in a studio cranked up. Um, now I can switch between any of those amps I want. If I can go to two, I can get the Marshall. Wow. Straight 100 watts from 1973, all harnessed by the aux, essentially. I just blew a fuse. <laughs> I think I reached the limit of like, it's gotta be no more than three amps on at one time. If I want to start out with like sort of a clean-ish sort of sound and add my pedals, I might start with my 2Rock TS1 that's in Bay 1 and I just click one there and we're good to go. Then I can hook pedals up and anything I want to add to it. And I'm good to go. If I want to do, you know, another track and jump over to the Marshall, we're fired up, we're ready to go. Standby, of course. Here we go. Now I can do over here too, if you want to swing around, you know, this is the aux app. So I have different things I can, you know, add. I can do the Marshall here and add some room sound. So lots 
of options, which wow. is really, really nice to have. A lot of times what I do though, is just leave myself one cabinet option because when you're in, your, when you're in a studio, you're only using one cabinet usually and you kind of tweak to taste. So that's an important yeah. thing to think about. But I could go over to the divided by, which will give me more of like, um, sort of a Vox meets a Marshall sort of thing. This is an RSA 23, really cool amp. So obviously we can we can keep going from there, but I can fire any of those amps up and do yeah. that. It's a lot, a lot of fun. Yeah. And then of course, still have my pedals that I can use or I can hook up a different board. Um, I'm a pedal kind of fanatic. I, I love using them just because I think there's something great about knobs still that I love. Yeah. <laughs> but there you have it. That's kind of kind of how I use that. And if, even if I wanted to program another aux to do different cabinets, I can hit speaker two. So it's a lot of flexibility without having a live cabinet in the room and still sounds. I've never had a complaint from any producer that I've ever sent tracks from with this rig. Oh yeah. Even before I built the fancy cabinet and all that stuff in here, it was always aux stuff and they always liked it. Is it necessary to run out stereo? No, but what I do, you'll notice on my app is I do sort of like a dual mono situation. So I am running stereo out of the box traditionally, but okay. I'm, the pans are straight up and down. So okay. it's kind of like, you know, like you would do in the studio where if you had a 57 and a 121, yep. you would mix it for like a mono guitar sound, even though it is two sources. Yep. So that's kind of how I do it. Um, if you wanted to go um, mono out of the aux, I just pan everything to one side at that point, ah. because then it would be out of whatever particular output of the box you're, ah, you're, you're okay. using it, you know. And then do you have any particular preferences on the line out level. Do you like to start at a certain place? Do you, how do you treat that? The aux has a ton of headroom I've noticed. So you don't really need a lot. Um, so if it's ever, I don't think I've ever had this thing past five in my life. Okay. Um, because I'll, I'll send it into my, my Apollo. And then lots of times I'll hit it with like a Helios plugin too, or something to kind of- a Little color? A little color. And I love that sort of forward mid range thing that the Helios has that's unobtrusive in my opinion. I think it's really makes my guitar tracks come alive. And then what do you think about the, uh, using it as a amp top box, load box? I don't well, do it. Well, I guess it. cause you're not in the cabs. Yeah, I don't really have to do it. Um, the thing that people get wrong about this is there's other ones out there that do it in a more like sort of logarithmic way, I guess, okay. because usually what happens with those other boxes is it converts your analog signal into digital, which allows you to have more of a stepped volume control where this one being that it's analog, there's only five settings on there. Mm -hmm. And their whole goal from what I understood when they developed this thing was to have analog, analog, analog outside of the digital modeling aspect so that your your sound here was not being altered in the box digitally other than the cabinet emulation. Mm. So you're getting all of what the normal amp would do and adding a digital back end essentially as opposed to using a digital power amp of some sort in here to let it do its bidding. God. I know it's kind of kind of weird, but that's yeah. what differentiates this from like the Waza box and stuff like that. This is just a voltage regulator. Um, a lot of these vintage amps, like pr particularly like this Baseman or the Marshall, they were built at a time when voltages coming from the power company weren't as high as they are today. I'm not an amp tech, I don't know the specifics, but it can be damaged. You can add some damage long-term to the transformer. Um, I believe the output transformer maybe it would be. Somebody correct me on that. Um, but I like to keep it somewhere in like the 114, 115 range okay. um, to kind of, because you'll notice if we turned everything off and turn this down to zero, it'd probably be like 125, 127 coming from the wall. Uh, in Nashville, I've seen studios and, and venues that have voltages of 130 volts coming out of the wall which is tough on these old amps. And lots of folks here like to play their old Deluxe or their old Princeton or the old basement. So you get, you get an Amp Maniac or uh, Brown Boxes are really popular. I like this one because I can really 
pinpoint the voltage that I want. So um, it's a cool, nice. little, cool little tool to have to make sure everything is safe and sound. And can you get those like anywhere? It says, did this you get is from like, that site? From, yeah, vintagesoundworkbench.com. A friend of mine told me about these and it's literally like a, like a box, looks like you build a metal shop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't want to discredit his builds, you know, but it is pretty basic, um, but I like it. How do you think about pedal boards and use them in the studio? It's kind of like, a, a box of, of crayons, you know? And if you have a big one, like there's a big board behind you that's in disarray that I had more as a studio board that had kind of the kitchen sink on it. Yeah. Um, I don't need that as much these days. This one here is like my little live rig that I use when I'm doing my solo gigs because it's pretty simple and it's got just about everything I need. Um, the other one there that's in the cabinet is a new build that I'm just experimenting with, but you know, a selection of drives, time-based effects, and you're gonna be good for just about any kind of session that I've run across. Now, the thing is, is like, the wackier you get, the more interesting you get, um, the the more you'll sacrifice how big your board's gonna be, mm -hmm. um, you know, how heavy it's gonna be. If you decide that that's your only board and then you gotta do a fly date somewhere, oh man, like, you're not gonna check that giant pedal board you know, because TSA will probably destroy it for one, it might get damaged, it might be really heavy, all those kinds of things really come into play with pedal boards. So um, that being said, XTS in Nashville, they're a godsend, they make my pedal boards. It's, a, it's an expense to have your board professionally wired, sure. but it's also an insurance policy at the same time. So like this is the one I use the most just because it's simple, it's my little in-town board. Um, let me use the, yeah, the two rocks since that would be sort of what I use the most live. And you'll see even here it's a little janky because I took a pedal out and I added one. So sorry to my guys, <laughs> I screwed your beautiful design up. Um, but I come into this Argo fuzz. You always want to have fuzzes early in your chain. Um, and this is a cool like octave fuzz where um, not only does it get a good fuzz sound. Wow. You can do, turn the blank control up and you can get the real high octave. Crank it even more. Wow. So that's a really, really fun pedal. It sounds great in a lot of positions and that's by my buddy Zach and Mythos, all those guys. From there, I don't exactly remember where it goes, <laughs> um, but the drives are important and there's the volume pedal. I'm a big drive stacker, so if that's kind of okay, like my yeah. bass, clean sound, when I'm doing my blues rock gigs, I want something. That's kind of like my bass sort of broken up clean sound. But then I want a little bit of a boost. I'll use the Greer light speed. because it just feels like the amplifier turned up. And then from there, I actually use that as a platform to kind of add other overdrives to it. So I might add this one. It's a, called a Barber Direct Drive, really great underrated um, overdrive pedal. But you can hear again, it just sorts to get bigger and not overwhelmingly different. It feels like an amp to me. Yeah. Um, and then this is a Cornerstone Gladio SC that gives me a little bit more of that sort of mid-range. More compressed. And of course I could use those by itself, but this is the process that I have because if I'm singing and playing, I don't want to go on, off, on, off. Where am I in the song? I just want to jump on it and go for it, you know? Absolutely. Um, from there, I got some other time-based stuff, a vibe machine. Great for like the Univibe. And I'm still kind of learning that pedal. As soon as you do that and you start to play Hendrix, it's kind of thing, oh, yeah. but I'm like, how can I make it not sound like Hendrix? 
but it just always makes you want to play like Hendrix. <laughs> so there's that. Um, the Rotosonic is a great rotary speaker from my friends at Keeley. Rotosonic. That is gosh, my favorite. Sound. It's hard to find a pedal that does that in a small footprint. Yeah. Um, everything else is usually pretty big. And this was purposely made small. I try to make a smaller board. The Keeley Halo delay and the Hydra are my delay and reverbs. So I can have a little slap. Oh, yeah. And then I'll have a long delay program, just a short. Nothing that's too crazy and out there. Oh, just nice. it's there when you stop kind of a thing. Uh, and a great reverb and tremolo over here. So if I have reverb on an amp, I don't mind adding more reverb to it. It's kind of a, makes for like a cool space. Um, but I might, you know, put on a plate. Something maybe a little longer. Wow, that's beautiful. It's a great sounding pedal. There's so much it can do. And it does a couple different tremolos. Oh. And now I'm like Americana guy. And I can do the really... Yeah, so... Lots of options in a small little board. Can we uh, hit on a couple of guitars? Yeah. Let's First do it. off, what's in your hands here? Tell me about oh, this. So one. this guitar is a '67 ES335 non-factory Bigsby, um, but like many guitars in Nashville, they've been owned by a few people, <laughs> and you hear rumors that someone's selling one or you know, put it in my friend's ear that, hey, I'm looking for this. And um, it had a headstock break, which is pretty normal for old Gibsons and ones that are affordable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just always connected with the 335 and could never find one that wasn't vintage that scratched all the itches. So this yeah. has been my favorite um, that I've gotten. Yeah, I have to say, I was looking for a guitar that I could always grab that always delivered for me. And, and I found it. My first vintage guitar, was this one. This is a 61 Casino, Epiphone Casino. I was on the hunt for uh, an ES330, and then a friend of mine, this was actually um, purchased from someone who bought it from Tom Bukovac, um, so it didn't go far. I said all guitars in Nashville belong to someone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so this was one of uh, Book's collection, and it is, it's killer. It's a really, really fun guitar. Great for, for all things. Um, now, I'll what like. kind of is that? Are those different types of pickups than you would? Yeah, so these are P90s. These okay. are what they call dog ear P90. Um, and they're really hot. They're like, for yeah. the age, you wouldn't expect a guitar this old to have like, you know, a nine point, you know, guitar pickup speak, you know, yeah. <laughs> on the output. It's damn close. It's really hot. Wow. But what's cool, flat wounds on this or anything, you start to sound like the meters. It's really cool. Like it has that that vibe of, of Leo for sure, Leo Nocentelli uh, of the meters. This is a 65 Trini Lopez that is in ridiculously cool shape. Pickups sound amazing on this. Just a little bit of buckle rash there. Um, and Trini Lopez was basically like a pop star of the time. And this was his signature model guitar. Um, and I wanted to kind of start building a collection and a friend of mine had this and he let me uh, do the friend financing, which yeah. means you don't pay all at one time. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, there's no way I'd be able to afford a guitar like this. Um, it just takes time. Um, but it's a, it's a really cool guitar. Pickups sound amazing. This is a Murphy Lab guitar that I bought from Sweetwater. Um, it's an amazing Murphy Lab light age, Dirty Lemon 59, Dirty Lemon Burst 59. Um, I never had a really good Les Paul. Um, and I always wanted a real deal Gibson. Um, the weight was right, the sound was right. I played it there. Um, they were, I was visiting them, they were driving me back to the airport and I was like, yeah, I think I want that Gibson. Can we, can we work something out? And they're like, mm -hmm. yeah, talk to us when, when you get home. So, you know, sold another Marshall and there it is, you know, <laughs> because don't let me fool you. Like, you know, musicians were always moving stuff sideways. It's just the way it works, you know. This is a 64 
yeah, 64 June, uh, SG Junior. The absolute greatest sounding rock and roll P90 I've ever heard. Um, super light, it's like a feather. Uh, I absolutely love this guitar. In my quest to get a 335, that looked like what I wanted. Um, it's currently under a state of repair. I have to put a different, I robbed the spring out of it and put it in that guitar. <laughs> so it's not playable right now, but a really wonderful builder in California, Josh Williams makes these guitars. This is called a Mockingbird, obviously very much like a 335, um, but the walnut finish um, and just sounds and feels great. Really great guitar. One of my, one I have on a desert island is my Novo Miris J. This is made by Dennis Fano here right in Nashville, about 15 minutes from where we're recording this. Wow. He made this for me a couple years ago. Dennis had a company called Fano Guitars. He sold that company and made Novo and they are the only new guitar I've ever really played that feels like it's old, yeah. but it's not. And yeah. it, they, it checks all the boxes. Dennis made what I think is like one of the coolest strats. They call this the Idris. So it's got that same neck as that one. So it feels great. Um, Lindy Franklin pickups. And I said, can you do this Antigua finish? It's a color that Fender came out with in, I guess the seventies, probably it was 60, probably late sixties. I could be wrong. Um, and it's either a love hate thing and pe some people hate Antigua, but I found some really cool yeah. images online and Dennis sent me a photo when he was about three quarters of the way done with this guitar. And I was like, you freaking nailed it. It is wow. so, I just think it looks great. Speaking of other strats and small builders, this is um, sort of a cooter caster what the heck? built by Waterslide out in California. I have flat wounds on this and I don't play a lot of slide, but it is an amazing slide guitar machine. It sounds so good. And when you put this bridge pickup on, it's like an overdrive pedal in the guitar. It's so powerful, but it has all that really great David Lindley you know, uh, running on empty sort of sound, which is what I was looking for. This is a Fender Custom Shop. It's a 68 uh, style. It's the Mike Landau, w one of the Mike Landau. They made several Mike Landau Custom Shops. Um, I just like big headstock strats um, when I do like strats. Um, yeah. And that's it, just kind of a straightforward, straightforward strat. I actually just tuned that, had that set up to E flat. Strats sound amazing when you're tuning them a half step flat. And I was doing a, Stevie Ray Vaughan guitar course, so that really helped with that too. Mm. Um, so I was like, let me have a Strat in the stable that's always tuned to yeah. that. As a kid growing up in the in the, the 80s, you know, you watch the movie Crossroads with Ralph Macchio and Steve Vai. This is a replica that Jackson did of Steve Vai's guitar when he played the character um, Jack Butler. So Jack Butler had this beautiful red metal flake guitar, you know, DiMarzio pickups, one volume knob, and occasionally I reach back into my childhood and, and play yeah, this guitar. Dude. So there's that. And then, you know, a guitar I got on a whim, just to try it because it was so inexpensive. It's this company called Sire that Larry Carlton is one of the founders of, he and Marcus Miller, actually. And I was like, there's no way this guitar for 700 bucks can be this nice. And it is phenomenal. Um, locking tuners, roasted neck, hum single single, really nice tremolo. I use it in a lot. I just used it on a session the other day. It is a great instrument for the money. It exceeded my expectations. So um, it's still kicking around. Like, nice. like I said, I move gear all the time. This might go to somebody that needs a good guitar at a low price someday. But um, for now, I'm still using it. So this is a Revolta. Revolta is made also by Dennis Fano. It's their imported brand. I love baritone guitars, and I always had uh, a Dan Electro kicking around, but I wanted something that had more sounds available and a real deal bridge and tailpiece, and okay. that's what these do. And I just thought this color was pretty oh, badass. Awesome. So, yeah. <laughs> and this makes it on recordings um, every now and again, and I just used it the other day, and it, it's it's got that real like piano low string kind of sound, like that's just tight and wiry, you know, yeah. and not real floppy. It's it's really nice and punchy. So this is a Teo Mando guitar uh, built by Teo. Um, I believe it's Terry Owsley is the gentleman that makes these guitars. I don't know if he's still doing it, um, but they're very similar to um, the old Vox guitars that were like this many years ago. It's basically an electric 12 string cut in half. Uh, so it's a half, you know, it's an octave mandolin guitar essentially. Wow. 
And I first heard Buddy Miller seeing, playing one of these um, when he was playing with Emmy Lou Harris uh, during the Wrecking Ball album, which is one of my favorite records ever. And just all the sounds he was getting out of this thing. I haven't played it in a while. It's like a cheese grater on your finger, so it can be pretty <laughs> tough. And it's hard to keep in tune until it really works its way into it in the string stretch. But aside from that, it's a really great sort of um, session like secret weapon, even yeah. more so than a, than a high strung guitar. It's just, because the fact that it's got electric pickups, you can really do some fun stuff with it. This was the first acoustic guitar I ever have. This is a old Wash, Washburn Festival series. Okay. And it probably looks a lot like if you've ever watched that video for Extremes More Than Words. That's why I wanted this guitar. My parents bought me this, I think, when I was like 16. Wow. And I've done a ton of acoustic gigs on this. When, when skinny acoustics with electronics were all the rage, this was the one I had. And I still have it, so I'm, I'm glad it's still the heirloom that it is, you know. Yeah. Um, but, you know, That's I don't have funny. a lot of acoustic guitars. I really love acoustic guitars. I just don't play them a lot. Um, so I ordered a custom Martin. Which, although it's wow. when you see custom Martin music, there's going to be like a bunch of inlay or you know bling on it. But having worked with them for so long and doing these clinics, I I, I got to know what really makes acoustic guitars tick: um, top woods, back woods, bracing, um, glue, um, the torrefaction process. Now, like so, I put everything they do, like. If you made a car like to really pimp the engine out like that's what i did i wanted it to kind of look like a model from maybe like 47 i looked at a triple o 18. so essentially it's a triple o 18 triple o being the body size 18 depicting the back and sides uh, this is sinker mahogany so it's that kind of mahogany that has been pulled from the bottom of a lake or a river for years so it's got all this sort of different tonality because of what the water has done to the wood a big chunky neck which martin doesn't do different style tuners um uh, the binding is madagascar rosewood so it's all this like kind of extra stuff but without the bling <laughs> Yeah, it has the torrified top, it's really balanced, it really speaks pretty loud. But yeah, I figured if I was gonna work with Martin, I had to get a guitar that really worked for me. So that was one. So that's like pretty much the extent. I'm pretty low on acoustics right now, but you know, maybe yes. I'll get more. Can we uh, flip over to studio recording world? Yeah, basically everything from the amp world runs through a snake and then it goes into my Apollo. And then I have a twin, not only for a couple inputs, but it's also my monitor control, which is really helpful. Sure. Um, so I'm, I'm constantly relying on that stuff. I don't do a lot with outboard gear, but I do have a uh, two-channel warm audio preamp here. That's the classic. 273? 273, exactly. Um, I love that one. Terrible. The 76, we know what that does, probably. Yep. It's my compressor. And then the uh, 610 Mark II, I'll just plug bass directly in and kind of adjust it for that. Um, but Beautiful. I, yeah, I mean, Simple. that's all I really need. Um, I, I think outboard gear is like the coolest, sexiest thing ever, but I don't have a need for it. <laughs> sure, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I do, I do appreciate it. And um, the warm stuff sounds great to me. And um, I've been a UA fan for, for many years, so happy to use that. You're using the studio, doing a lot of guitar work. You also do a lot of YouTube um, and course work. Being uh, someone that wants to put high quality stuff out on the internet, is is a whole new world because now you're actually being watched <laughs> in yeah. addition to being heard yeah um so when i record videos i'll just sit in this chair and kind of maneuver myself and maneuver these cameras so these are just i just use sony a7 threes um these are the the atmos uh, ninja fives that are not only a field monitor but also um, a hard drive in them as well. So that's what Andrew's using currently, and it's just a lifesaver. Um, simple one softbox setup. Um, I just got this Sennheiser. I think it's an MKE one. I, you know, when I watch these things, I'm like, how come people don't know their own gear? Now I understand because <laughs> you get you get so in, you know engulfed in all of it. But I'll just move this thing right here, just kind of point it at my chest, and it is an amazing sounding boom mic. Um, I used to use a lav all the time, and I until I got that. Um, but what I do for a live stream is I have this little camera here. Oh, and I'll cool. just bring that down, um, and then I'll use 
This is the SD1 from Universal Audio. I'll use that. Um, I could I could use this mic, but I, I don't that much. Um, and I just got like a little overhead set up here um, that I can hook an arm on and then a camera can go that way. Oh, cool. And that's how I've been doing, like I'll set pedals up here. Yeah. And then I'll use, I'll use my little black magic switcher and that'll switch me between camera shots. Um, nice. And yeah, so it's, you know, just accumulating all this stuff to make your life and workflow easier and hopefully high quality. So when I shoot a course, that's pretty much how I'm doing it too. All the audio is going into the Apollo, either my voice here or guitar there. And that's pretty much it. It's pretty straightforward. It takes a lot of ingenuity to kind of say, well, how can I best utilize the space, you know, to be efficient for sure. Yeah. It's a challenge. <laughs> can you uh, tell people where can they find you and like any cool courses or projects coming out soon? So I'm on YouTube, just my name, Corey Congelio. I do a lot of lessons and we do a lot of gear chat stuff too, whether it's a demo or we do a lot of live streams now where we're really giving some honest opinions of gear. It's a lot of fun. But um, my teaching website is called workingclassguitar.com and I have 20 online guitar courses there. We do uh, monthly subscription membership style things where included in your membership is a, a Zoom hang that we do once a month, which is really fun. And we're always trying to get new content um, out for the VIPs even before they go on sale uh, as a course. So we do courses and we do memberships. Um, and That's cool. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's been such a wonderful experience to build this business over less than two years. Wow. Well, congratulations on it. Thanks, um, man. I really love all the work that you're doing and I'll put links to website, YouTube channel, all that stuff. Yeah, down below. we'll even give your, your viewers a 14 day free trial. Cool. Um, so they can check out the website free for 14 days and it's just like probably less than a Starbucks visit a month <laughs> after that. So yeah. Awesome. Thank you so Thanks, much, man. man. So glad you could come over. All right. We'll see you guys in the next video.